Hello, everybody, and welcome to Yoma Atma'ut 2020 from home. I'm your host, Miss Gerson. I know that this year it's a little bit different. We're spending Yoma Atma'ut in our homes, in our living rooms, in our couches, away from everybody else, and that seems a little bit strange. But you know what? Just because we're not together in person doesn't mean that we're not together. We have an amazing show here for you today, so let's get ready. Buckle up. Turn your volume on. I see you. Turn your volume on. That's right. And let's get started. Let's have an amazing, amazing day. Welcome to my living room. Got my Bamba, my Bisley. Got my Israeli flag. Got my background. Let's get started. We thought that would be great to start off today, uh, the Yoma Atzma'ut at home, discussing why and how Yoma Atzma'ut even came to be. David Ben-Gurion declared an independent state of Israel on May 14th, 1948, and a new chapter of Jewish history began. The British had controlled Palestine under the British mandate, but that expired at midnight, and so the early Zionists declared a new nation. Some of them had lived in the land for generations, and some were new arrivals from Nazi Europe. For a couple of years, May 14th was a day for mourning lost soldiers. Then in 1951, Israel decided to split the day into two parts, Yom HaZikaron, Remembrance Day, and Yom HaAtzma'ut, Independence Day. It is celebrated on the 5th of Iyar, or one of the days right around it. In 1953, Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, was also added to this period, happening eight days earlier. Yom HaZikaron begins at night with a minute-long siren where the whole country stops and stands in silence. Another siren the next morning kicks off the official memorial ceremonies, as well as private ones where people remember their loved ones. As night falls, the memorial mood shifts quickly as Israelis move into party mode, and Yom HaAtzma'ut begins, starting with a formal state torch lighting ceremony on Mount Herzl in Jerusalem, to fireworks over Rabin Square in Tel Aviv, to street parties everywhere. As the night goes on, the party gets more and more lively, of course, and the next day is all about a barbecue on the beach or at the park with absolutely everyone else. Around the world, Jewish communities join in solidarity with those in Israel by wearing blue and white to celebrate the Israeli flag, eating classic foods like hummus, falafel, watermelon feta kebabs, and of course, bamba. Folk dancing is a fun old school tradition, and lots of communities host big parties featuring Israeli rock bands, artists, and nonprofits. In synagogues, some communities say the psalms of praise called Hillel, or the prayer for miracles, al Nisim. Why? Because, for some Jews, the founding of the state was a religious historical event, the fulfillment of a biblical promise to Abraham and Sarah that the land they walked would one day be home to their children's children. There's some difference here about who says what, but the basic idea for these religious Zionists is that Yom Atzmot is a modern holy day. Not so for secular Zionists who remember and celebrate, but without the religious overtones. About 20% of the state is not Jewish at all. They are Muslim, they are Christian, they are Druzi, or they are foreign students and workers of different religions. They see the day differently. Some feel, despite the religious difference, a patriotism and respect for the Holy Land as a Jewish and democratic state. Others mark the day with protests and memorials on behalf of the Arabs who fell in battles or fled the land in 1948. Taken together, Yom HaShoah, Yom HaZikaron, and Yom HaTzma'ut constitute a week that is sometimes called the Israeli High Holidays. Daniel Hartman writes, The sadness of Yom HaZikaron does not give new meaning to Yom HaTzma'ut. Rather, it gives it gravitas. It reminds us of the price we paid and, as a result, the care, responsibility, and duty we have to build a great country and to live and to give our lives special meaning. Wow, that was pretty interesting. What we're going to do next is we're lucky enough to have an amazing call with somebody who actually lived during the time period when the Declaration of Independence was signed. Let's get him on the phone. Let's get it all set up. He's so ancient. I don't think he knows how to use this.
Shalom, David Ben Gorion. Is that you? Are uh, you yes, there? Mrs. Gerson. It's a pleasure. Pleasure to speak to you. It's so nice to have you here. Thank you so much for joining us. Yom Atzma'ut 2020. Stay at home. We really appreciate it. How are you doing? How was your flight in? Uh, my flight was great. Uh, it was a wonderful flight. Uh, I haven't really been on very many airplanes. Um, I sat next to a man, Rabbi Dr. Sasha Bakarik. He spoke to me in many languages. I didn't understand them, but it was a nice conversation anyway. He insisted we play chess. He won, but I let him win. <laughs> I'm sure you did. Thank you so much again. Um, do you mind sharing with us? We're all just so eager to know. We have so many questions. Can you just tell me, please, how did it feel when the state of Israel was declared? How, what was it like? Just tell us. What, like, what did it, it feel like? It was the greatest moment of my life. It was the culmination of thousands of years of Jewish history all came down to that moment. What a privilege to be able to declare the creation of Medina Israel. Wow. That's really incredible. Really powerful. Wow. When you were in the process of creating and thinking about creating the state of Israel, what was your vision? What was your vision for the state of Israel? Well, my vision was for a, a, a country, a modern country, but also a country that highlights the, the history and culture of our people. Well, of course, we would settle throughout the whole land. Uh, I know that the Neg I believe that the Negev is of, of the utmost importance. In fact, it would be great one day if there was a university, maybe a university or a college created with my name in the Negev would be nice. Um, and I'm not asking, but if, if that were to happen, I wouldn't be upset. What about an airport? Would you like an airport named after you as well? Nah. Um, I'm sure you're so curious about what Israel looks like now. Yeah, it was great to, it was great to see the beginning of the state of Israel. But it would be just so incredible to see what it becomes 30, 40, 50, 60, even 70 years down the road would be incredible. You think you could show that to me? I can. I'm going to share my screen with you right now. And I'm going to show you a video that allows you to see everything about Israel, how Israel has changed over the years. Are you ready? I'm ready. So what did you think of that video, seeing the physical locations of Israel changing over time? That was incredible. That was absolutely amazing. What else can you show me? Well, actually, a lot of things have developed over the course of the years. The army has developed. Technology has developed. Agriculture has developed. You wanted the Negev to bloom. Let me show you this video where you can see all of those things and all those advancement that took place. Israel's geographical structure is diverse and the soil and climatic conditions are mostly harsh. This led to the amassing of expertise and experience in agriculture in challenging areas with unique characteristics. Breakthrough discoveries have been made in this area. With desertification on the rise globally and water sources shrinking constantly, our farmers and researchers work to develop innovative solutions that are efficient and environmentally friendly. Israel is considered a leading pioneer in water and irrigation technologies. Dozens of technologies have been developed in Israel in this field, from water purification to water recycling and irrigation with treated wastewater, all of which enable efficient agricultural production. Drip irrigation, the most efficient irrigation method on earth, was developed in Israel. 
Volcani Center researchers have developed systems which provide climate monitoring and control in greenhouses, namely temperature, humidity, and ventilation control. For a plant to grow and produce, it needs ideal conditions that aren't necessarily provided by nature or in its growing habitat. Welcome to the future of agriculture. Our advanced systems developed in Israel enable us to map and analyze crops and accurately observe and measure all parameters necessary for an ideal habitat for the plant while maximizing resource utilization. After a fruit or vegetable has been picked, it's the post-harvest period in which fruit quality gradually degrades in many cases leading to an increasing amount of produce losses, resulting in massive financial losses. Our scientists have developed advanced means and methods to extend the shelf life of fruit without affecting taste or aroma. Research and development in labs across the country, predominantly Volcani Center, led to the development of high-yield varieties more resistant to adverse climate conditions, pests, and diseases. They are more aromatic and contain higher nutritional value. Our world is changing rapidly. World population is increasing along with the standard of living. Our needs grow while climate change impacts our environment and limits our attempts to increase world agricultural production. Today, with the knowledge accumulated over the years, Israel can provide advanced solutions to many of these challenges around the world. Think agriculture. Think Israel. Our seven amazing Israeli inventions that will change lives forever. This incredible invention uses artificial intelligence and a smart camera to help the blind discover the world around them. I'm not blind, but if I was blind, I'd be like, whoa! Gosh, I'm thirsty, but the sink is all the way over there. Only there was a machine that could create water out of thin air. Wait a minute. Introducing WaterGen, an amazing new machine. Groundbreaking technology. It turns air into water. Air into water. Pulse and more. This miraculous handheld device lets women take ultrasounds on their cell phones and then mail them to their doctors. Congratulations. It's a pizza. Baby, you This wouldn't have happened if you had Mobileye. Mobileye is a vision-based advanced driver assistance system that helps prevent car accidents and it's the main technology behind autonomous cars. But real autonomous cars, not like this one. This is a toy. Clone. Clone is an app that will instantly 3D scan anything you want. Now Rexy will live forever. He's a good boy. He's right. Bonus Biogroup. This Israeli biotech company actually grows bones from a patient's own cells. This here is a femur that belongs to Fred. It's Fred's femur. Flytrex is an autonomous, regulated, and insured drone that will deliver things to you anytime, anywhere, any minute now. That's it for now from Sosa, one of the many innovative open platforms here in Israel. If you care, Share. Let me tell you a story. It's a story about a country. It's a story about a land. It's about spirit. It's about our legacy. It's about doing things for other people because you're a friend and because they once did. It's a story about purpose, about a vision, about a journey to excel without stopping. achieve every goal and even though it may be tough
we raise our heads and march on. It is 71 years of small stories that together broke the story of one army. Of one nation. It's a success story. It's a story of victory. This is our story. This is the story of Israel. Wow, oh my gosh, that was incredible. It was amazing. This is the best country I've ever established. I am so happy to hear that. After seeing all of this, Mr. David Ben-Gurion, can you tell me, what are your thoughts? What are your thoughts about current Israel right now? It has exceeded my wildest dreams. But you, but you know, Ms. Gerson, I wish I could hear what a randomly selected group of high school students from suburban New Jersey would have to say about the state of Israel. You know, that's a great idea. Let's get that ready for you right now. If I had to be quarantined one place in Israel, it would be Netanya because the weather is beautiful, it's by the beach, and it's just so nice there. If I could quarantine anywhere in Israel, I'd probably choose a lot because of all the pretty beaches. I'd probably choose the Golan just because of how nice the scenery is and how beautiful it is there. I think that if I had to be quarantined in any place in Israel, it would be a lot because it's my favorite place and it's beautiful there and I don't think I could possibly get bored. Quarantine in Renana because it's a suburban area, so the virus doesn't get too congested, and it's pretty rich, pretty American. You know the vibes. If I were to be quarantined in Israel, I'd pick Tel Aviv because it's a really nice city. Israel, I want to be quarantined in a lot because it's so crazy there, and the weather is always nice. If I were to quarantine anywhere in Israel, it'd be at the King David Hotel. If I had to be quarantined anywhere in Israel, it would probably be Tel Aviv because it's just so pretty there. I'll tell you what. If I were to be quarantined anywhere in Israel, it'd definitely be anywhere where they have those fresh desserts. Mm -mm -mm. The place that I would want to be quarantined in is Tel Aviv. I think Tel Aviv is really nice, has really nice food, and really nice If I had to be quarantined anywhere in Israel, it would be Tel Aviv because it's so pretty and there's so many nice places to walk around. If I could be quarantined anywhere in Israel, it would definitely have to be in Yerushalayim, looking down at the Kotel and into the old city. If I had to be quarantined anywhere in Israel, I'd do it in Tel Aviv so I can sneak over to the beach and swim in my pool. My favorite Israeli food is falafel because no matter where you go, it's really good. I really like hummus, um, so hummus, I guess, counts. My favorite food in Israel is shawarma because it's really good and you can't really get it around here. Probably have to choose shawarma lafa just because of how easy it is to get in Israel and how good it tastes. And my favorite Israeli food is shawarma on lafa. I would say shawarma is my favorite Israeli food, but choosing meat food is kind of like cheating, so I'm going to go with falafel. My favorite Israeli food would probably be falafel because the falafels in Israel are so good. My favorite Israeli food is falafel because it is really good. My favorite Israeli food is shawarma. My favorite Israeli food would probably be the ice cream because they have like really good ice cream there. So. If I worked on a kibbutz, I'd probably want to take care of the animals. If I had to work on a kibbutz, my job would be to take care of the animals because I love animals and why not? Who doesn't love playing with sheep? Um, on a kibbutz, I would love to milk the cows. If I worked on the kibbutz, I would probably help with like making the food. If I worked on a kibbutz, my ideal job would probably be to work in the kitchen because I really like cooking. My favorite Israeli slang word is sababa. My favorite Israeli slang word is yalla. I need the shock. I'm in shock, you know? Got it? 
My favorite Israeli slang word is sababa. Favorite Israeli slang word is yala. My favorite Israeli slang word would have to be sababa because that's the only one that I know of and it's really fun to pronounce. If I had to choose one teacher to run for prime minister, I'd probably choose Rabbi Carrick just because of how many languages he speaks. If any teacher would be prime minister, it's Mr. Cipriani because he's educated and relatable. The teacher in our school that would most likely run for Prime Minister of Israel would probably be Ms. Gerson because she's very smart and good at planning things. Mrs. Mintz should definitely run for Prime Minister of the State of Israel. It would be more of guy because she's so passionate about Israel and loves it so much. If I were to pick one teacher to run for Prime Minister of Israel, I'd pick Ms. Fuchs because of her love and dedication to Israel. I think Rabbi Shelsberg would make a good Prime Minister because he always has everyone's best interest in mind. I think that Rabbi Kirsch would make a great Prime Minister for Israel because he would strengthen the American-Israel relationship. If any of our faculty members was to be Prime Minister of Israel, it would 100% be our Rishi Shiva Rabbi Rubin because he's one of the greatest intellects. He has lived in Israel for a certain point of his life and he fought for the country and he just loves it. Who I would be picking to be our Prime Minister of Israel is definitely Miss Graham because her fierce attitude will definitely lead us to where we need to be. I just faculty member to be the Prime Minister of Israel would have to be Rabbi Hamudot. I would definitely pick Rabbi Hamudot. I think Rabbi Hamudot definitely be Rabbi Hamudot. Definitely Rabbi Hamudot. I think Rabbi Hamudot should run for Israeli Prime Minister. You can't be a guy in an election if he has you taken out first. He would be a great leader, and he knows the people because he visits Israel so frequently, and he would just be great for Israel. I never even talked to him, and uh, that's the intimidation factor right there. Because, like, obviously he's lived there, he has a lot of experience, and I feel like he knows what would be best, and I just like that he has very firm beliefs. I'm like a great Prime Minister of Israel because he already has experience in the Mossad because I don't think it's a coincidence that when there are uprisings in the West Bank or the Gaza Strip that Rabbi Chomudo just goes missing from school and he definitely has some ties in the government. Which RKYHS teacher should be running to be Prime Minister of Israel? That's so easy. Rabbi Chomudo. After all, he's probably protecting the Prime Minister from all the terrorists and bad people out there. Israel is so important to me because it's the only country I can go to where everyone's just like me. Israel is important to me because it's a place full of history that we get to learn about every day in school. Israel means so much to me because it's our home and it's a place where we all belong. Israel means so much to me because of how beautiful it is and because it is the land of the Jewish people. The reason Israel means so much to me is because of how hard we've had to work to get it. Like blood, sweat, and tears have all gone into you know, keeping this country and the fact that it really shows when you speak to these people because of how much they love their country and so much pride they all have. Israel means so much to me because it's my homeland. Israel means so much to me because it's the most amazing feeling in the world knowing that as a Jew I have a place that I can just go to and feel so loved and welcomed and explore my culture and I'm just so grateful for it. Israel means a lot to me because it's a wonderfully Jewish state and after fighting so hard for it, we saw it to this day, which is really special. Israel means a lot to me because whenever I go there, I always feel welcomed and it's like a second home to me. Israel means so much to me because it's part of my Jewish history and every time I'm there, I feel very welcomed. Israel means so much to me because it's where our heritage is from and I also really like the food. The state of Israel means so much to me because the state is a refuge for Jews all around the world. Had Israel been around during the Holocaust and World War II, my grandfather, along with his extended family, would not have had to hide underground away from the Nazis, but would have had a welcoming Jewish state like they do now. Israel means so much to me because it protects Jews throughout the world. Israel means so much to me because it is like a second home to me. Great job, guys. That video really made me hungry. You know, all of your teachers are stuck home too, and they wish more than anything that they can be with you on Yom Ha'atzma'ut. Today, one of the most fun days that we have on the school calendar. So, they couldn't miss up the opportunity to sharing some ideas and messages with you. Without further ado, take a look at this video and see what they have to say. 
One of my favorite memories while living in Israel is when I took a mysterious hike with an enterprising friend. He was a fearless, relentless person who had a tremendous zest for life because he had emerged after uh, sustaining serious injuries while he was in the army. And as a result, he wanted to take every single moment out of life and get the most out of it. So we went up to a place called Givat Shul. You must be familiar with Tanakh. It's also the same place of Pilek, Ishba Giva, in Perak Yutet, near Piskat Ze'ev. It's the top of a very high peak that has a 360 panoramic view. You can see all the way to Amman in one hand and all of Jerusalem in the other hand. When we reached the top of the mountain, we ended up with a shell, empty, incomplete palace that was in the process of being built by King Hussein himself. King Hussein wanted to establish that hilltop as the, the, the summer home of the Jordanian monarch, establishing his sovereignty over East Jerusalem. He could not have known just in two years that that would fall into Israeli hands as Tzahal fought its way through East Jerusalem, ultimately capturing Har Habayat Biadenu. Well, we went up to this palace. It was, uh, you could see the pillars and the floors and how magnificent it would have been. And it's empty, it's barren, it's an open land and anyone has full access to it. And as I was walking through the palace, I realized how special Eretz Yisrael is. That every inch, every rock, every hilltop has got a story. It's the story of Shevet Binyamin, it's the story of Shaul, it's the story of Pilegesh by Giva, it's the story of Tzahal, it's the story of King Hussein and his, and his lost dreams, it's the story of the Jordanians occupying Jerusalem. And everyone is in Israel making that story. Every Jewish person is creating a new chapter in history. And I felt for that moment that I was connecting to hundreds of years of history while I was also connecting to centuries of history and at the same time looking at the modern state of Israel with the modern story that we're creating now. I, the name of that place is Tel El Ful. That's the word in Arabic. And actually Tel El Ful means it's a hill of beans. And uh, I think that the uh, Hashemite kingdom probably looks at the empty, incomplete palace literally as a, as a hill of beans because it's still there as it stood in 1965. I took the liberty of taking a tile from uh, what would have been the kitchen of King Hussein's palace. I have it in a plastic lucite container in my house, always to remember that Jewish history is not in the past, it's in the present. Dear students and faculty members at Ray Kushner Yeshiva High School, I have the great schut, the wonderful merit of living in Israel for seven and a half years, and I have so many places and so many memories that I love and I'll always treasure. But for me, perhaps, the one place that means the most, and more importantly, the time at that place, is Vatikin, the sunrise minion at the Kotel Hamaravi. You see, if you come on a busy day, like Hoshana Rabbah morning or Shavuot early in the morning, there are tens of thousands of people davening early, early in the morning. Svardim, Ashkenazim, Hasidim, Haredim, Datiim, it doesn't make a difference. The place is mobbed and everyone's davening. And there's a huge roar of tefillah, of prayer, which is beautiful. But the moment the clock hits sunrise, Netzachama, Kivatikin, there's absolute silence. Because everybody begins the Amidah, begins the silent Shemona Esrei, the silent devotion, together. And you can literally feel the Kedusha. You could feel the holiness, you could feel the achdut, you could feel the unity. And to me, that's the most special place. It's also the most special time. May we all merit to be part of that experience really quickly. And may the Kotel HaMaravi be restored to its full grandeur and glamour with the rebuilding of the Beit HaMikdash in our days. Aksameach, everyone. Israel has always held a special place in my heart. But even more so, a few years ago, my son and his family made Aliyah, and they live in Beit Shemesh, and they're doing really, really well. They've added to their family, a little girl. And over the past three years, I've had the privilege to spend Pesach, not this year, in Tveria with my entire family. So that's also one of my favorite places right now. And the Kinera is at its fullest that it could be, which is amazing. Hello, everyone. 
I want to show you a couple things on this special day that I really enjoyed when I went to Israel last summer. Have a great day. Wow, that was pretty cool, wasn't it? Now, some of you may be wondering, what's going on in Israel right now? What's Israel doing to fight this pandemic, to stop the coronavirus? Now, as we know, medical professionals and scientists all around the world and in Israel are doing everything that they can to treat patients and to find a cure. In Israel, a small community decided that they were going to show appreciation to their medical professionals in the best way that they knew how. Take a look at this clip and see what they did. That was really sweet. Nothing can beat that type of standing ovation. In other news, Haredi soldiers in the Israeli army who are currently quarantined on base and have been quarantined on base for quite some time have started collecting names for all of the people who have passed away due to coronavirus and they are currently saying Kadesh for them in a minion. Isn't that so incredible? They're the only people who really can be in a group together because they've been quarantined together and they're choosing to spend their time davening for all of the people that have passed. I can't think of anything better than that. Mika Amcha Yisrael, who is like the Jewish people. Who? Just who? I really just, I don't even know. That's unbelievable. Now, all around the world, many men are finding it very difficult to not daven in a minion and are getting a little bit creative to try to figure out different ways to be able to do that. This one man in Israel went to the middle of the intersection when nobody was there because it's nice and empty and started singing Hallel so that everybody in the community can follow along and respond. Take a look at this clip. Finally, something that's always given me a little bit of inspiration is this clip that I stumbled upon of the first man in Israel who got coronavirus, who walked out of the hospital completely cured. His reaction, he's not a religious man, and his reaction completely breaks my heart. Take a look at that. <laughs> Well, there you have it, everybody. Israel is still pretty awesome. Take a look at this video, which emphasizes the point even more, and maybe you'll see some familiar faces. I'm only one call away I'll be there 
better save the day. Superman got nothing on me. I'm only one call away. One unit has become legendary, the Israeli medical unit. We did everything that we can to be as fast as possible on ground. Israel is only the world's 152nd biggest country, but it's always one of the first to send disaster relief all over the globe. The earthquake in Haiti. The tsunami in Japan. The typhoon in the Philippines. Save a Child's Heart brings children with life-threatening heart defects to Israel for cardiac care. Save a Child's Heart brings children from all over the world. From Ethiopia and Iraq. From Syria. Tanzania. From Sudan. Gaza and Palestinian territories, even when these countries are actually at war with Israel. Save a Child's Heart volunteers and doctors transport and treat these kids in Israel free of charge. Innovation Africa brings Israeli technology to rural African villages. Volunteers have built schools, medical clinics, and changed the lives of over 750,000 people by providing tools for solar power and clean water. Israel goes beyond its borders to save a life. Change the world. Make a difference. Israel is more than just a country. Israel. It's people helping other people. When you feel like hope is gone, just run into my arms. I'm only one call away. I'll be there to save the day. Superman got none. All right, David Ben-Gurion, this is almost all the time that we have. Can you tell me, last question, what do you think about modern day Israel? Is it anything like you imagined? After seeing all the videos that you've shown me, it's clear, one thing is very clear to me. The state of Israel, Medina Israel, is a ray of light. Ray of light. It's a ray of light, a light into all the nations, a light for the whole world. I couldn't have said it better myself. At this very moment, two other plane loads of Olim are preparing to leave for Israel, one from the UK and one from Canada, for a total of 520 Olim. This is a letter from the Chief Rabbi of England, who wants to welcome you home. Israel is a place that Jews will always consider their home. It's a lifelong dream. We've been thinking about this for at least 10 years. 18 years I've been waiting to make Aliyah. Now I'm going with my family. It's about time. It's just, it's a dream. It's been a dream for the past five, six years actually going Aliyah. And to fulfill a dream that I've always had since I was a little boy. It's just a place, it's the Jewish place, it's my homeland. Finally we just decided that we're going to go now and uh, we're going to 
and I'll start our life now. I just feel more alive when I'm in Israel. They're gonna come join me in a couple years, right guys? Yeah. Israel's the holy land, and I'm very glad that I'm moving there. Way down the road. Please start saying goodbye to your friends and family. To all the guests, the family, the friends, the neighbors who are here to say goodbye, it is extremely difficult, but really just be comforted by the pride that you have in your family, friends, and neighbors that are making Aliyah. I'm making Aliyah because uh, it's my homeland. I'm very excited. We're going to Israel! I'm very excited taking all the Olim Achadashim to Israel. I'm very excited uh, for the Olim. There's a lot of interest in this that people are willing to go to their lives. On behalf of the entire staff, I would like to wish you a Mazal Tov on this incredible journey. We have three flights arriving. Three flights landing in one day. One flight from JFK. From Canada. One flight coming in from London. And from the UK, all land simultaneously. I feel wind blowing in from the east. Can you My children are going to live in Israel. They're going to grow up as Israelis and uh, it's a fantastic, fantastic feeling. Members of the Nefesh Nefesh staff will be walking along the aisle to begin the processing of their aliyah. Come back to me now. I can hear my mama calling me. Hear my mama calling. Come back. This core connection or their core love of moving to Israel, this idealism of moving to Israel, really breaks the differences between one Jew and the next. In a few minutes, we will be passing out hats and stickers. This should be worn by everyone. And the last security and ground personnel to distinguish us from the crowd to run You shall inherit and you shall settle. The moment you stepped foot off that plane, you inherited a land of centuries of sacrifices, of tears, of dreams, and of yearning. You're not running away from something, you're running to something. You're running to the homeland, you're running to come home. That's a wrap. Thank you so much for joining us today for Yoma Atzma'ut 2020, staying at home. 
It was a pleasure having all of you. I hope all of you and your families are staying safe, stay good, and we'll see you when we see you, which will hopefully be very soon. Have a great day. Miss Gilson, oh, that's French. <laughs> it's even better. <laughs> I told you it was bad. Uh, Miss Gerson, these videos are great, but uh, do you know a, an old friend of mine, uh, Rabbi Hamudot? I've met him, what, once or twice. Yeah, uh, I've, I've been looking for him for the past couple of years and I haven't even, uh, I don't know what happened to him. Maybe you've heard of him. And do your best imitation of an Israeli. Uh, Fabibi. APAC!